All right, so be brave and invite somebody to church, but don't do it like that. Amen. Don't have a little sin egg. And, and uh, people know they sin. They don't need us to tell them they sin. Amen. They need us to tell, they need us to tell them what's right. Amen. We're going to talk about that this morning. That's Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right, well, let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love and grace. Father, we thank you for your people that are here today. And we're not here to, to see a person. We're here to hear from you. So we're asking you, Holy Spirit, to help us have ears to, to hear and hearts to receive and eyes to see. And that as we leave today, that our thought won't be, hey, what a great church or what a great message, but that our thoughts would be, what a great Savior. And we give you praise for it all, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. Part two in our series today, Jesus first. Jesus first. Jesus first. Our theme verse, Matthew 6, 33, says, But seek first the kingdom of God. And we talked about that last week. That's God's way of doing and being and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So last week we talked a lot about the kingdom of God, his way of doing and being. And listen, God's a God of order, amen. He doesn't do things by happenstance, by random. There's a specific reason for it. And you know what I also love about that too? He even takes our mess ups and turns them into victories. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I was sitting there thinking uh, one day this week how God is so good that he'll take even our mistakes and failures, and according to, to Romans 6, uh, 23, I believe it is, uh, he said, uh, was it 6, 23? It says, for God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And he is such a pro at it that it's hard for you to even tell if it was a mistake or not a mistake. That's how good he is. Isn't that awesome? He's always working things together for our good. Now, here's the confidence you can have on that. Even when you miss the mark, even when you mess up, you can trust and believe that God is good and that he's working that thing out for your good. Now, I got a, one of those little lifesaver things right here, and so I'm not dipping I don't have a little pinch between my cheek and gum. That's one of them. Uh, Brother Daryl gave me one of these, and they're big. They're big things, you know. And it reminds me of that preacher that he knew, he knew how long to preach as he'd take a, a, a lifesaver like that and put it in his mouth. And when that thing finally dissolved, he knew it was time for his message to be over. But one Sunday, he accidentally put a button in his mouth. And I heard he's still preaching, amen. But at least he didn't swallow a button. I swallowed a button a few Sundays ago, and a button came off, put it in my pocket, had my handful of vitamins that I took after I got my Bojangles biscuit back in the kitchen back there after set up, and I threw all that stuff in my mouth and swallowed it, and I told my wife to bring her, her, her sewing kit, and then I called her and said, honey, bring a sewing kit, but bring me a button too, because I just swallowed my button. It was in there with all my vitamins. So anyway, praise God. And uh, yes, hallelujah. All right, well, let's seek first the kingdom of God. God's way of doing, God's way of being. He even works things out for us when we mess up and we make mistakes. Isn't that a loving father for you? And then it says here too, look, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And I love that he gives us some clear directive. It's not our righteousness. It's not our righteousness, but it's his righteousness. Now, what's the difference on that? See, listen, there's nothing about us that's righteous. You know, back in the 60s, they'd say, dude, or the 70s, like, dude, that's righteous. That's righteous, man. Dude, that's righteous. Well, there's nothing about us that's righteous. He says, listen, he says, even our best are as filthy rags. There's nothing about that. And listen, self-righteousness is very dangerous, particularly people in the church world. When you think that it's because of your singing or your teaching, or your giving, or your any of that, or your soul winning that's going to gain you righteousness, that's, that's shallow ground. See, I really believe that when he says to that group in the last days that says, he, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're saying, but Lord, we did this in your name, and we did that in your name. He said, but I never knew you. What that means is they were counting on their religious activity to earn them their righteousness. And what is righteousness? Righteousness just simply means right standing with the Father. Right standing with the Father. Do you understand today that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that no matter what your week was like last week, no matter how good you were or even how bad you were, 
Your right standing with God is righteous simply because of one factor, and his name is Jesus Christ. And this is why the word tells us it's the gift of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift, and it's a position that we've been placed in simply because of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way. If the blood of bulls and goats could make, you, could make Israel righteous for a year, how much more would the blood from the spotless lamb of God make us righteous for all eternity? And that's exactly what he's done. So therefore, there's no need for any more sacrifices because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, the lamb of God that died for us on the cross and took away our sin. Listen, I don't understand it, and it certainly wasn't fair, but he became sin And he made us righteous. He says, how that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. So we're righteous and we're right with God. And that's our standing, which has nothing to do with our behavior. So what's it got to do with then, man? Our belief. It's just simply about our belief and our simple trust in Jesus Amen. And this will really help you because when you do have bad days and you do make mistakes and you do have failures in your life, when those moments come, if you'll get your eyes off yourself and keep your eyes on Jesus and know that you're all right with God in spite of your humanity and in spite of the fact that you may miss the mark every now and then. Hopefully, you, 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 you're not sinless, but hopefully you sin less. Amen? Jesus was sinless, but because of him and this transformation, we sin less. If we can keep our eyes off of ourselves and just keep our eyes on him, the enemy can't get us into that ditch that he tries to get us in. See, he is, he is super scheming all the time. See, he lures us with this sin and this temptation. Oh, you know you want to do that. Go ahead and do it. And then we succumb and we do it. Or we walk in the enemy's trap. And then he's right there to accuse us and to beat us up for doing what he told us to do. Right? And, if we, and, and see, that's condemnation. But Paul says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to miss the mark sometimes. I'm going to fail and I'm going to make mistakes. And if you're looking at me as I talked last week about follow me as I follow Christ, that came from the apostle Paul who called himself the chiefest of sinners, by the way. Follow me as I follow Christ. Listen, because that's my heart, right? But my heart don't always line up with my actions. But even when it doesn't, I know that I'm right with God because of the status that Jesus placed upon my life. And this will keep you from falling in that valley of condemnation, that ditch of condemnation that our adversary loves to get us in. When he gets us in that ditch of condemnation, it yields us ineffective. Paul says this, he says, you condemn yourself. Or Peter says this, you condemn yourself. And he says, when someone asks you to pray for them, you don't have the faith to pray because you're walking in condemnation. we got to keep our eyes on Jesus, amen? So I've chased a rabbit. I've kind of gotten off the beaten path a little bit, but amen, God still is good, right? I'm preaching my sermon before I preach my sermon. We're going to still be out of here at 12, amen? It's 11, 13 now. Y'all ready for this? Let's look at this. Let's just change gears for a moment. Let's change gears for a moment. And listen, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the difference between transformation and conformity. Transformation and conformity. Well, what do you mean? Well, let me take you down a journey real quick, okay? You ready for this? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. How many of you need some things added unto you? I need some things added unto me, amen? I got bills due next week. I got stuff that, and I need, I need some things to be added. In other words, what he's saying right here, if you read between the lines, if you'll stay in this place of rest and you'll flow with me, my way of doing and being, the being is the righteous part, then I'm going to add everything you need. All these things are going to be added unto you. Isn't that a blessing? Now, here's the real truth. Here's the status Isaiah prophesied it in the book of uh, in the book of Isaiah. In fact, uh, I'm gonna pull a verse out for you. Isaiah 5:20. Isaiah is prophesying about what it would be like one day in the earth. And here's what he said: Isaiah 5:20. He said, "There'll be a day when they will say that right is wrong, and that wrong is right." He says, "There'll be a day when they'll say that black is white, and white is black, and that bitter is sweet." And sweet is bitter. Now, can I just help you with something? Just because the world says it doesn't mean it's the truth. 
And listen, if there's ever been that time, we are sure enough in that time when in my lifetime, I've seen things that you just knew were right that the world calls wrong now. And things that you knew were wrong, but yet the world calls right now. Isn't that interesting? This is when I got up early and I'm watching some news and there's this, uh, the, the, the interviewer is interviewing three pastors, a pastor in Texas, a guy that's with, not a pastor, but he's, he, he's a, with a group that makes Christian films, and then another guy by the name of Pastor Jensen Franklin that pastors a church in, in, uh, in Georgia. And the question was, this question of, uh, there's a pressure uh, among pastors today to be very careful what they say in the pulpit. And, and so the question was, is do you find that to be true pastors on the guest panel, those pastors that were, on the, that were guests, and, 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 and is, it, you know, is there a way around that? And listen, that is the truth. Can I be honest with you? And see, here's what we got to do as the church. We can't let what the world's doing and being and saying affect what we do in here because we're the house of God. Amen? And Jesus said it this way. Listen, Jesus said it like this. Jesus called us. Jesus called us, and I'm getting way ahead of it, but Jesus called us to be salt and to, and to be light. He said, and if the salt loses its savor, it's no good. And if you take your light and you put a bushel over it or you hide something over it, nobody's going to see your light anymore. So basically, he's urging the, the listener to stay salt and light in a world that don't like salt and light. Amen? Are you with me this? Come on, let me get a little head nod. Somebody help me in here. You with me? Amen. Come on, I got one right there, a hand in the air. Amen? But this is the day and the hour that we're living in. And, and you know what? I could relate to what these guys were talking about this morning because there's a pressure that you find maybe in your job, in the workplace. There's a political correctness, and there's a tide of this that's out there. And you, and, and you find yourself, because you don't, you don't want to offend anybody. Why, why, why are we worried about offending? Let, let me just say this. I just want to be on the side of truth. Now, if the truth offends you, I'm sorry, but does the truth, can the truth not be the truth anymore because we're so worried about somebody getting offended? Or should we make our mind up, you know what, I'm going to stay with the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Now, I, heard, I can hear that voice. Well, I, think, I thought you were a grace preacher. I am a grace preacher. But I'm going to choose Jesus first. And I'm gonna, I want to be on the side of Jesus. And Jesus says this the, law, this. the word says the law came through Moses. I've got the verse right here. I can throw it up on the screen. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know that double-edged sword that we talked about a few weeks ago that circumcises your heart? It's a two-edged sword, and it rightly divides the word of, to help us rightly divide the word of truth. And listen, that's exactly what it does. It's grace and it's truth. It's truth and it's grace. And we find ourselves in that place today. We find ourselves that way in society now look at this. Now I'm reading, I'm, I'm going to read you a verse from the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I'm going to read you four verses. And he had such a revelation on the grace of God, but yet this is what he told his understudy, his, his protege, Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor in the ministry, and he's trying to encourage Timothy. Timothy had some fear issues and some intimidation issues. He allowed himself to be bullied at times. And Paul's trying to get him, give him some encouragement. And here's what he says to him in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. He says, I solemnly urge you, Timothy, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Just preach the word of God. Amen? Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Whether, whether it's politically correct or it's not politically correct, Timothy, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you to preach the word. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. That's interesting. Because, see, we live in this world where we don't want nobody to tell us nothing, and we do this while we're saying it. Don't you, who do you think you are going to tell me to? But, see, the word of God, listen, and this is New Covenant world word, it wants to patiently correct us. When we get off course, the Word of God wants to correct us and get us back on course, rebuke us, encourage us with good teaching. That's what God's Word does. Amen. See, that's that two-edged sword. It'll get you this way, then it cleans you up as it comes back up this way. 
It had been one of them things. I remember going to a little shopping center with my mom when I was a little kid. And there was this guy at this table. And he was demonstrating these knives because he wanted my mom to buy this set of knives. And he was doing, he just made that thing look so good and so easy. He knew what he was doing. Well, listen, the Holy Spirit is the expert. And he's a, he knows how to hold the sword of the Spirit and teach us and correct us and to bring us in alignment with the Word. Now, see, we're talking about Jesus first. And here's what happens. Here's, here's how I know See, there's, there's a ditch on either side of the road, and the devil doesn't care what ditch he gets you in just as long as he gets you in a ditch. Because if he gets you in a ditch, you're not going anywhere. What I want to do is I want to let the Word, the Word of God, the new covenant Word, be my guide to help me stay on the path. David said, oh, that you would keep me on the path of life. I want to stay on the path of life. I don't want to get in a ditch, amen? And he wants to guide me and help me do it. He, he, he keeps on, he keeps on, and he tells Timothy this. this is, here's what he tells him. In verse number three, he says, for time is coming, he's saying, Timothy, for time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires, New King James says their own lust, and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Now, I'm not reading from the Old Testament. Are you with me? I'm reading from the New Testament from the guy who had more revelation about the grace of God than anybody that's ever walked planet Earth. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy, there's going to be a time coming. And he's not even talking about the world here. You know what he's talking about right here? He's talking about the church. There's nobody to teach outside the walls of the church. But within the church, listen, listen, there is a pressure to just go with the flow. But can I just be honest with you? Some things just still ain't right. There's some things that still ain't right, and they still ain't right even today. And, and here's the problem. If you hear right teaching and you look at the one doing the teaching like they're wrong, chances are you're actually wrong, and you just don't want to hear the truth. Come on, amen or oh me right here. Let me get something from somebody, amen. Amen or oh me. Now, now listen, listen. Here's the tendency, and here's the pressure. And see, we're living in it today. I can just be honest with you. It's going to get greater and greater and greater before Jesus' return. If you and me don't stand up for the truth, and we're God's people, who in the world is going to do it? Who in the world is going to do it? Nobody's going to do it. And yes, there is this pressure. And listen, there are some things that just aren't right. It's just not the way it's supposed to be. And I didn't make that up. And let me tell you something. We're not talking about stuff that was in the law. We're talking about right living that Paul talks about in the new covenant for you and me. And I'm going to do a whole series on this one, uh, sometime in the future called Living in the Therefore. Living in the Therefore. Listen, he would teach the grace of God and then he would say, now therefore, this is how you live. Because of what Jesus has done and because of this grace and this position of righteousness and, and, and we believe right, therefore, this is how we live. This is how we live. Let me read this to you real quick. Romans 12, 2. I'm going to read it. Let me, let me just quote it for you in King James or New King James. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've heard that, right? Let me read this to you in the Amplified. Y'all, my sir is gone now. Praise God, it's the last little bit of it, okay? So we're in the short rows, all right? Romans 12, 2. Here's what Paul says. Romans writing, listen, you, you want to talk about a book that explains the grace of God? Read Romans. Read First and Second Corinthians. Romans right here in Romans 12, 2. Here's what he's telling God's people. He says, and do not be conformed to this world any longer. Now, this is the amplified version. Any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively change as you mature spiritually by renewing your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself what, 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 what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Paul's telling the church right here, resist the temptation to be conformed by the world. See, our job is to transform the world, not to be conformed by the world. If we are salt and we are light, they're not...
changing us. Come on. We're supposed to be changing them. Amen. And so if we join in with them and we just say, well, you know, anything goes. It's all right. Y'all just, you know, praise God. Listen, we won't fish any way we can get them. Amen. And we will let God clean them up. Amen. We'll let God clean them up. Amen. We want the fish. We want, you come on in any way, but that doesn't mean we want you to stay like that. That's not God's plan for you to stay there. God wants you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this word transform, the, 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 the movie The Transformers, it's big, right? Transform means it's, it's from the it's Greek word metamorphosis, where we get the word metamorphosis. And it literally means it's being transformed into something else. God wants us to be transformed into something else. But how? What's the answer? By the renewing of our mind. Now, renewing is another word. We get the word remodeling out of that. Have you ever remodeled something? Remodeling something's a lot easier, harder than building it from the ground up. Because when you remodel, you got you got all the demo work. You got to take out a whole lot of stuff before you can put the right stuff in. And that's that's a big part of the job. In fact, that's probably the hardest part of the job is pulling all that stuff out. And for us as believers. That's what we got to do. We got to be transformed by the renewing and the remodeling of our mind. So now I could preach this message right here, and half the church, well, I would say two thirds of the church will probably agree with me. At least half the church will would agree with me. And, 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 and we would all agree, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He's the way to the Father, we'd all agree. We, we, we have what we share those fundamentals of the faith. And, and, and most of us would agree, would agree that, yes, man, as the church, we need to live right. We need to be right. We need to do right. We need to be salt and light. We need to be the witness. Absolutely, we need to. Where I may differ with most of them is how you get there. How you get there. How do you get there? Now, let's listen, here, here's not the altar call. The altar call is, I haven't given you the problem, and now I'm going to say, now, so bless God, we got to do better. Bless God, we got to get our mess right. Bless God, you need to. See, when you hear the you need it, you better, you better start running. Bless God, you need to read your Bible more. Bless God, you need to pray more. Bless God, you need to, you need to, you need to. There is no more you need to. So most of us would agree, listen, that right living, holy living, living separate from the world, not letting their ways come in and affect us is important. How many would agree right there? Come on. Let me just get a, yeah, that's right. Amen. But, the, but here's the next part. How do we get there? And how we don't get there is by focusing on ourselves. That's incestuous. That's cannibalism. I can't eat from myself and get anything nutritious out of that. I got to eat from, I got to have some other source other than me to, to live and to grow. Amen. So let's look at the answer. And the answer is found, really, the beginning of the answer is found in the Genesis. I've been hearing some people talk about the Genesis. Let's return to the Genesis of this investigation. Where are they getting this word Genesis? They're getting it from Genesis, they're getting it from the Bible. Let's return to the Genesis, okay? Well, let's just return, let's just take a, a brief look at the Genesis, and you know what happened in Genesis. God sets Adam and Eve up in that garden, and they give them, basically, you know what they give them? They give them a piece of heaven on earth is what they give them. He gives them. I mean, they have no need. Would you say that if you know what this word sozo is, I got a slight ring if you can bring me down just a hair. If you know what the word sozo is, and we talk about it all the time, it's the Greek word for saved, and it literally means to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. Would you say that Adam and Eve had every bit of that in the Garden of Eden? There was nothing missing and there was nothing broken in their life. They had everything they could need. They were fully supplied, and not only that, they had unbridled, unhindered fellowship with God himself. God himself would come down in the cool of the day, maybe the, the twilight evening hours, and he would come and he would walk and talk with Adam and Eve. Now, can you imagine life being, and that's a picture that is hard for us to grasp. But that's exactly what they had in the garden. But their adversary, the devil, came along with a lie. And he presented that lie to Eve, and you know the story. I'm not going to read all the verses. He mixes in a little bit of truth with the lie, and he gets her to buy the lie. And that's what religion does. He's very religious. He uses religion as one of his greatest weapons. And he, he mixed in a little bit of truth with a whole lot of lie, and she bought it. 
And so she ends up eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God had told him, say, hey, I'm setting you up here. I'm giving you everything you need. I've got one tree in the, in the center of this garden. I've got one tree that's the tree of life, and then I've got another tree over here that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of that tree, I do not want you to eat because in the day you eat that, you're going to die. Death's going to come on you, and this is going to end. Everything, I'm paraphrasing the Lord, everything good we got going on is going to come to a crashing end if you eat from that tree. But you can eat everything else in this garden, and particularly you can eat from this tree of life as much as you want. And she bought the lie. And you know what the lie was? Basically, I'm going to paraphrase the lie. The lie from the enemy was God's keeping something from you. He knows that when you eat from this tree of knowledge and good and evil, you're going to know good and evil just like him. And so therefore, and he doesn't want you to be like him, so he's keeping something from you. Isn't that interesting? And see, that's, that's what a lot of believers do too. See, Christians don't really have a sin problem. We have an identity crisis, you see, because right believing will just produce right living. You see, a cow never has a struggle with being a cow. And a dog never has a struggle with being a dog. And, and it's so funny to me, particularly it's a, a, a particular type of breed, a bloodline. It, they don't have to be around any other dog that shows them what to do. It's just innately in them, right? I got a dog that his whole world evolves around you throwing a ball and him bringing it back to you. He's a, he's a, he's a Labrador retriever. And that's, that's how he's bred. And no one's ever, he's never been duck hunting. I keep telling my wife, we want to do a rent-a-dog program. We rent him out to duck hunters that don't have their own dog, honey. And she says, we're not doing that. I don't want him out there with them guns and shooting at ducks. What if they hit him by mistake, right? But Bo would do it. He would love to do it. And, and it's just innate in him. And so the same way is for you and me. If all you ever hear, will you focus on me real quick? Listen, if all you ever hear in your life is that you are just a sinner, saved by grace, but the big focus is on your sinnerness, then what are you going to think of yourself as? I'm a sinner. And what do sinners do? Sinners sin. And if you're a big sinner, guess what? You're going to sin a lot. And if you're a little sinner, you're going to sin just a little bit. Some of us have been big sinners. But see, that's not the truth at all. In fact, that scripture is nowhere in the Bible. But yet we got songs out of it, and they sound really hip and religious, but that's not the... See, he says when we come to Christ, we are a whole new creation. We are actually something that has never existed before. And he says that we are the righteousness of God through him. So if you hear, on the other hand, that you are the righteousness of God all day, then guess what you might start to act like? The righteousness of God. And you might end up being that salt and light and not even realizing that you're being salt and light as you're being salt and light. You see the difference? And sure enough, she ate from that wrong tree. And guess what? The moment she did, she knew right from wrong, just like God. Her eyes were open, and she knew right from wrong. And thus, she struggled with her behavior for the rest of her life. So did her husband, and so did everybody that came from Adam and Eve from then on. And that's you and me. You and I can trace our lineage all the way back to those two. And yes, they probably have special guards around their mansion in heaven because everybody's mad at them for what they did. But the reality of it is if it had been you and me, we'd have done the same thing. We'd have done the same thing. Because we didn't have the ability within ourselves to keep that flow going. But one would come that would. Now, here's what, here's what God told them. As a rebuke, not just a rebuke, but as the new way it was because of what they had done. He says, hey, Adam, you're going you're gonna to get, your, you're gonna get your, your, your food now from tending the soil. You're going you're gonna to have some sweat in it now. There's some things. And, and the, that's when the curse started. But thank God, God's redeemed us from the curse. And now we have favor. Amen. We don't have to rely on all that anymore. Jesus did make a way. Amen. But the curse started right there in the Garden of Eden. And here was the curse that he particularly gave to the adversary, the enemy. Here's what he told the devil. This is in Genesis 3.15. God is speaking. He said, I will put enmity, enmity. I'll put, I'll put enmity. I'll put, help me, baby, enmity. Enmity is uh, strife. I'll put contention between you and the woman. Now, how many women in here like snakes? I don't see a hand anywhere, right? Now, some women do. That's just a very rare breed, right? I don't even like snakes. If you want to hear me scream like a girl, you just let a snake cross in front of me. I don't care what kind of snake it is. In fact, really, I only don't like four kinds of snakes. Big ones, little ones, dead ones, and alive ones. Amen? I don't like any snakes, right? 
And here's what she said. He said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. And here's what else he said. And between your seed, your offspring, and her seed. And if you read this in the New King James, that second word seed is a capital S. Whoa. That says divinity. I'm going to put enmity between your seed devil, all your offspring, all your little minions that are going to come down through history. I'm going to put enmity between you and her seed, capital S. And he, the capital S seed, will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, what's he saying? That sounds like a lot of code for something. What's he saying? God is saying in the Garden of Eden, I'm going to right this wrong with my own seed. Now, see, I couldn't understand this growing up. Why come God didn't just come down as God and just fix this mess? First of all, why would he even allow Adam and Eve to sin? Because he wanted a family. He wanted his family to be able to choose. So he gave them a choice. The Garden of Eden had to have a choice, and it had the choice. It didn't have a lot of choices. Everything was all good except this one choice. Don't eat from that tree, but you can't eat from that tree, and they ate from the wrong tree, Right? But that's how it was. I mean, do you want your wife to love you guys because she has to or because she chooses to and she wants to? Are you with me? That's the difference. You know what I mean? Husbands, wives, you want your husbands to love you because he has to or because he wants to? You want him to choose you or, 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 or just maybe you're the only one that would say yes? You want him to choose you. And listen, so God, our Father, wants us to choose him, and he gave us choice. We made the wrong choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice, and his passed down through every generation. And and really, there was no choice after that. We were messed up. We just had to offer sacrifices every year. There was nothing that could atone for our sin and our mistake because of the first Adam until the second Adam, as he's called, capital S and seed, came. Jesus. Now, see, God couldn't just come down and fix it because he'd given man all the authority in the earth. See, God couldn't fix illegally what Satan had stole illegally. He had to do it legally and in order. So he would have to send his son. But in order to send his son, he'd have to have a right to do it. He'd given mankind the rights to the earth. Isn't that interesting? So he's not a God that's going to get out of order to fix it. He was looking for an orderly way to get his son into the earth so he could bring that capital S seed into the earth, Jesus. How did he do it? He finds a man named Abraham. His name was Abram first. And then the word Abraham, when he added the H in it, that's grace, that's the hav, that's the favor of God. And it literally meant when he said it all together, father of many nations, this man who is 90 years old and he has no son. He's never had a son because his wife is bare and he's too old and they have no child. And then God says, I'm going to give you a son and I want you to go to this land that I'm going to show you. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accredited unto him as righteousness. You see, and that you and I, as we believe in Jesus, we are heirs of Abraham. And he's basically saying we get all this the same way Abraham did, and we get our righteousness by faith. Isn't that interesting? Abraham believed God, and here's what happens God finally gives him that son, and then out of nowhere, God asks him to do this crazy thing. He says, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Lord, I want you to get up and I want you to go take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to go offer him as a sacrifice on this altar that I'm going to show you. And he didn't argue with the Lord. He just got up the next day, him, his son, they had a donkey and some servants, and they started traveling in that direction. Isn't this crazy? And I say, I remember my grandma was my Sunday school teacher, right, back in the day. And she put this stuff up on the flannel graph board. Kids, y'all don't even know what flannel graph is, so Google that, and you'll see. She put these little characters up on the flannel graph, right? And I always remember when she got to the story of of, of Isaac and, and Abraham and Isaac, you know, there'd be the altar, and Isaac would have this bundle of wood on his shoulders, And all she would say, and that's all she knew because that's what she'd been told, was Abraham was just, God was just trying to test, oh, Abraham, just to see if he would follow him. And although I would agree that it was a test, it wasn't a test for test's sake. God was applying a test to the covenant that he'd established with Abraham. You see, they made a covenant. When when God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you this son, he said, well, how can I be sure? 
In other words, he said to the Lord, if you've been in real estate, you ever bought a house, nothing's, nothing's official until you put it in writing. That's what they taught us in real estate school. Nothing's official until you reduce it to writing. Then Abraham was like, Lord, I need you to put that in writing for me. And writing of their day was the covenant. And they would take pieces of animals and they'd split them in half, separate them apart. And then both parts with their shoes off, both parties with their shoes off would pass through the blood between the two pieces of the animals. And that's how they did it. And I don't understand that language, but we don't understand. We, we understand English in the American language, but in other parts of the world, they got different ways of doing things. And in Abraham's day, that's how they cut a cut. They call it cutting a covenant. That's how they cut a covenant. And God cut a covenant with Abraham. And from that day on, Abraham never questioned or doubted because he had it in writing what God was going to do for him. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God says, now take your son, your only son. I want you to go offer him up as a sacrifice on this cross. And Abraham didn't argue. He just got up the next day. I would have argued. How many of you here would you would have argued? I would have argued. I see, well, you're not wrong. You're just human. <laughs> We'd all argued. Lord, are you serious? This makes no sense. I've waited for 100 years to get a son, and now you're going to tell me to go offer him as a sacrifice on the altar? That, that sounds crazy. He never argued. He just did it. And the Bible says that as they traveled, he saw the mountain afar off. What mountain was that? Scholars believe that that was the mountain. That that was Jerusalem that he saw, which is highly elevated. It's, it's, it's really on a plateau. Israel's on a plateau, and he saw even on the plateau a peak. And some scholars actually believe as they were on their way up, they're actually climbing up what later became known as even Golgotha. Wow. And Abraham builds this altar, and he takes Isaac, who went willingly. He says, Dad, I've got the knife, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham replies prophetically, although he didn't know it was prophetically. He says, the, he says, God will provide himself a lamb. And they get up there. And he ties that boy up. He didn't struggle. He didn't fight his father. He lays down willingly on the altar, bound on the altar, wood underneath him. Dad's about to light the fire from all the kindling in the wood. And he's got the knife getting ready to come right down through his center part of his chest to take him out in one blow. And as the knife is coming out, the angel of the Lord stops him. He says, stop, Abraham. Now, there's a ram caught in the thicket. Use that as a sacrifice. God knows that you'd spare not even your son for me. And that was God's permission. He wasn't trying to mess with Abraham and play some game called a test. He was looking for a legal way to get his own son. Remember, Abraham, take your son, your only son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's looking for a way to bring that capital S seed that he prophesied in Genesis. He's looking for a way to get him in the earth legally so that it could never be legally questioned. See, the devil is religious, but he's also a legal scholar. And he would challenge you in the courts of heaven if you don't do it the legal and right way. And God came in in a legal way. And here's how covenant works. Here's how it works. Covenant works this way. Covenant works this way. If me and Dave are in covenant and Dave gives me his best, I'm obligated by the rules of covenant to reciprocate and give him my best. Now, you're always better when you're in covenant with someone much better off than you are because if David gave me a Rolex and that was his best and I gave him a Seiko, which was my best, I'm going to be better off than he is, right? But if he gives me his best and I'm in possession of a Rolex, I got to return by giving him my very best. That's how covenant... See, we don't, not, we don't understand a lot about covenant. That's why people can betray you in a heartbeat because they have no revelation of what a covenant is and how to be in covenant with somebody. Covenant, and that's what marriage is. It's a covenant, amen? There's so many things that really are covenant, but we don't understand the value and the importance of keeping a covenant. Well, covenant says if I give you my best, you have to give me back your best. And Abraham gives his best, his one and only begotten son, and God is now obligated, which he wanted to be anyway, to give him his best, which would be his only son. Son for son. Son for son. Are you with me? 4,000 years later, listen, Jesus Christ would be the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world that laid his life down willingly on the altar in that very same spot on a hill called Golgotha because he was that seed, capital S. And all that day, the devil thought he had him. The devil thought he had God, that it was done. The Bible says had he known what he would have done, he would have never done it. 
If he had known what he, he was playing right into God's plan of redemption for you and for me. And the devil helped him all the way. Do you think God knows how to repay evil for good? Do you think he knows how to get things right and back in order? He's the master at it. And he took all the devil's scheming and he brought that capital S seed. See, the devil never knew who that seed was going to be. That's why he had Cain kill Abel. He thought it was the next one. And Abel's sacrifice was approved by God while Cain's wasn't. And so the devil came in Cain and had him kill his brother Abel. Devil's thinking that's the seed. See, the devil's smart, but he don't know everything. You see, that's why he had Moses in Moses' time. Had all the baby boys killed throughout Israel because he knew that there was a seed coming to rescue Israel from the captivity of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? And when the wise men went looking for the king of the Jews to go worship him, the savior of the world, remember that? Herod sends an edict to kill every male baby in Bethlehem because he's trying his best to find the capital S seed and kill him before the fix would be in. You see, you see, the devil did deal Jesus a blow that day. But at best, it was a blow to the foot. You see, if I take a ball, if I take a Louisville slugger and I hit you in your heel, you may not be able to walk for a few days. I might break your heel. It'll heal back up and you'll be okay eventually. But if I did that to your head, it would kill you. If you did that to my head, you'd kill me. And he's saying here, even in that garden prophecy, he says, listen, devil, you're going to do something that you think is really going to take him out, but you're only going to be hitting his heel. But he is going to bruise your head. You see, a bruise says there was major trauma, there was blood, there was, there was trauma there. He said, he's going to take you out eventually. And that's the seed, capital S, and he did it. You see, he did it. Now, what's this got to do with you and me? It's got a lot. It's got a lot. And only if the folks had known it that went and grabbed their palm branches that day and started waving them. As Jesus rides in on a donkey coming into Jerusalem that way, scholars believe he came, some scholars believe he came through the sheep gate, which was where the sheep and the lambs came through the gate as they were taken to the temple to be inspected before they were sold to people to be the sacrifices as people came to Jerusalem during the Passover time of the year, which was the same time of year. There's probably lambs all around Jesus as they're walking through, and Jesus is riding in on a donkey through that same gate. And the people start grabbing their palm branches. Bert was pulling in the Lowe's yesterday, and I saw his Harbor Church sticker, and he was going to get some palms. He wanted to put some palms out, a palm plant. They're grabbing their palm branches, and they're waving. And you know what they were saying? They were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And you know what Hosanna means in Hebrew? It means Savior, Savior. They're saying the right words, but it's out of conformity and not transformation. You see, if I just get you to say some words... That don't mean nothing. But if it can come out of your heart and you say it, then it means everything. They're saying the right words, but they're not saying it based on the real revelation of who Jesus is. They think that he's the Savior that's going to come rescue them from the captivity that they're in with the Romans from the Roman government. They were captive from the Roman Roman, The Roman government really had captured the known world in that day, and they were living under Roman oppression, and they're thinking, yes, this is the Savior and the Messiah that's coming to set Jerusalem back in order and take us back to the glory days again. He's come to make Israel great again. Come on, you know, red hat and all, right? But that's not what it was. He was the Savior indeed, and the Savior with a capital S because he was the seed that the father was talking about in Genesis. And what he come to do? He came to take away the sin of the world. Isn't that amazing? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God sent, verse 7, and God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Saved as in taken back to the very place in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were before they ever knew what sin was. 
You know what their first words to Jesus, God was in the garden? When God came and he, was, he, he knew what had happened, he saw the whole thing. He comes down in his normal time of the day to walk with them in the cool of the day and enjoy that unhindered, unbridled fellowship, and he couldn't find them anywhere. They had hid themselves with God because they were ashamed. They were ashamed. And he called out and he called out and finally they answered. And he said, why did you hide? He said, because we're naked. We say it like that in Beaufort County, naked. It was, it's naked. But we say, we were naked. And he said, well, who told you you were naked? We don't really know who told us. All we know is we ate from that tree over there, which is called the knowledge of good and evil. And somehow we just thought this must be evil. We're naked. Wow. Isn't that something? So the seed, capital S, had to come. And listen, not only was he the seed, but he was the way. He says right here, look, John 14, 6 says this. Jesus answered them. And he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. No one has that unbridled, unhindered fellowship that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden except by me. And so what he is saying is, is you can have all that again. It just looks a little different. And now we just get it by faith and not by sight. We call those things that are not as though they were. And we live by faith and not by sight. And we can have salvation. Paul says it's really close to you. He says it's in your heart and it's in your mouth. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And we know the Greek word saved is this word sozo. To be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. And not only did Jesus come to save us from our sins, but to save us to this abundant life that he talks about in John 10, 10, when he says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and that you may have it to the full. Jesus is the way. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. The way came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That was the way. And see, they got disappointed real quickly, too. Church folk can do that on you. They can turn on, on you fast. And, and he, they're waving, and they're saying, Savior, Savior, Savior. But he, th their disappointment led many in that same crowd a week later to start shouting, Crucify, Crucify, Crucify. What changed? You didn't understand who was riding on the donkey. The way was riding on the donkey. The way, the truth, and the life. See, can, can I help you with something? The answer is, is we don't not acknowledge the truth. You with me? Let me help you with something. Sin's not okay. It's still not okay. It wasn't okay then, and Paul tells us it's not okay today. You with me? See, grace isn't anything goes. Grace is Jesus is the way. Amen? And he's not the way to conformity. He's here as the way to transformation. Because if your answer to sin is by doing better and trying and you need to, you need to, you need to, then you're missing it and all you're doing is conforming and you're not being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you see this? I know people in this room right now, and I could call your names out. I'm going to try not to look at you because I don't even th want you to think I'm talking about you, but I am. I have seen something in your life that goes way beyond conformity. And there's some folks close to you that's near and dear to your life that's seen it too because it never worked before no matter how hard you ever tried. But when you started getting up under the message of grace and understanding that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it started changing you from the inside out and now your light is shining and everyone around you can see it. Now what do you want? You want some conformity today? You want a little religion today, or do you want transformation today? Jesus, see, we, we, sin is sin. Yes, what you did was wrong, and you used to do some wrong stuff. We all did. We all did. And listen, there's no category to it. Sin, sin, and it's all bad. But what's the way out? The way out is Jesus. The way out is understanding who you really are in Christ, and you grab a hold of that truth because Jesus made a way. And it's not about anymore how many times you read your Bible in a day or a week. It's not about anymore how much you give. And it's not about how often you come to church. It's about you believing right. 
that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what will change you from the inside out. You see, sin's not the answer. Conforming with the world's not the answer. But I can't be my own source of light. I got to have a source in me greater than myself to give off that light. And his name is Jesus and he's the way. Amen. So if you or someone close to you has a sin problem, they've got an identity crisis. If they've ever believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they just need to be reminded of who they are. They need to understand that there's a therefore there. And the therefore is there for a reason. And because he has done this for you, this is who you are. And when you understand who you are, that will affect how you behave. Now, God, this is the gospel of grace. This is the gospel of grace. Some people say, oh, that's greasy. They'll preach greasy grace down there at that church. This ain't, ain't nothing greasy about this, baby. This is, this is good stuff. This will change your life. And his name is Jesus. But he changes us from the inside out. No longer are we worried about the fruit, the fruit, the fruit. Now it's about the root, the root, the root. Paul says that your roots would go down deeply into his love and that you would know the width and the height and the depth and the breadth of God's love for you. Torn Wells has this song out. I don't even know if I'll get the lyrics right. But basically, he's like, you know me and yet you love me. Nobody knows you like he does. There's nobody on the planet I don't care if you've been married 65 years. Nobody knows you like he does. Yet, he loves you more than anybody. Wow. And listen, his love never fails. And tomorrow morning when you get up, there's a fresh batch of mercy waiting on you even before you make your first cup of coffee. And it's new every single morning. Now, here's what we do. We get that down in us. And then we let that take us from glory to glory to glory, and from faith to faith to faith. Amen. That's renewing our minds. We're tearing out all this old junk that says do good, get good, do bad, get bad. And we, get, we, we just renew our minds. And that is even when I do bad, I get good. Did you know he says that the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance? That makes you say, God, Father, I've lived like this at times in my life, but yet you have blessed me and given me favor. There must be something to this righteousness. And so I thank you that I've been made righteous. I thank you that when you see me, you must really see me like your son because you never hold it against me because you poured all your wrath out upon Jesus on the cross that I, could, I would know nothing but your goodness and your love. So I say thank you. And you know what that makes you do? It makes you fall in love with your Savior. When we're reminded, so when, you, when you start getting into the you need tos, and we do it to ourselves. We don't even need nobody's help. It's our natural flesh that makes us feel better when you've read five chapters instead of one today. You know? They came back from casting out demons and open blinded eyes and healing the sick and causing the lame to walk. And the disciples came to Jesus, and they were just all stoked about it. Lord Jesus, this is what happened. We did this and this. And he said, hey, stop, 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 stop. Great. But let your joy be based on the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not how many Facebook followers you got. Come on. Not how big of a crowd you've, you've, you've created. How big of a following you've mustered. How many great things the Lord's done through your life. Because that's how it works. It's him doing it through you and not, of us, not, not us of ourselves. And we just rejoice that our name's written in the Lamb's book of life in spite of ourselves. Amen. Are you excited and thankful this morning for the seed, capital S? Are you excited and thankful this morning for the way, the truth, and the life? He is the way. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Hallelujah. As Courtney becomes to play and softly play. As they pass out that communion, would you do this this morning, just this moment? Would you just get your eyes on Jesus with me for just a moment? Would you just think about this sacrifice of the Father, 
that willingly didn't have to be coerced or made to do so, but he went to that cross on our behalf willingly. Even in the garden, he didn't want to do it in his own manly human flesh, but he said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. The Bible says, why? For what? For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and he despised the shame. And listen, you were the joy. You were the joy. Can we thank him this morning as they pass out that communion? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.